Today, Pastor David continues our series called Authentic Christianity, where we will see that a life surrendered to Christ is a life that submits to one another. Take a moment now and prepare your heart for today's service. We're going to be reading from Ephesians 5, starting with verse 18. It says, Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you speak to us, Lord. Sometimes we can feel so insignificant in the world. But we're significant to you. So significant that you died on the cross for us. You sent your son to die on the cross for us. And so significant that you take time for each of us. Lord, I pray that today as we listen to the word that you've given Pastor Javen, Lord, I just pray that we open our hearts, that your spirit remain heavy in this place and rest on us, Lord. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I heard a speaker share this uh, one time, and I thought, this is genius. This is a great way to think about this. But you may have come to a realization in your life that there are people with more more er than you in your life. What did I say? More hair? No, not more hair. More er. And here's what, here's what I mean by that, all right? There are people in this life that are richer. They're healthier, Right? They, they, they have jobs that you think are better than, than yours, right? There are people that you feel like they're more talented than you, right? They've got that more er. And, and if, now if you're in here and you're saying, Javen, that's not me. There's nobody that has more more er than me. Well, then I would encourage you to go back to next last week's message and hear Paul's words that encourage us to be more humbler uh, in, in our life. Um, <laughs> Or maybe you're just better at doing what we're going to talk about today. But the truth of the matter is that they're, they're, we realize that. So what we do, the way we navigate that in our life is we often put ourselves around people that are that we, we think are lesser than us so that we can be their helper and uh, and we can make ourselves look be- look good, right? But in, in, in all actuality, what we're trying to do is make ourselves feel superior uh, to them when we're doing that. Um, and then because of the nature within us, we don't want to just have more than other people. We want to be the S, right? We want to be the rich S. We want to be the smartest person in the room. We want to be the healthiest person. We want to be the bulkiest person, right? We want to be, we want to be the person that's the best. We want to represent that in our life. And, and, but maybe you could care lesser about what I'm talking about right now and, uh, or couldn't care any lesser. And, and so you, really, cause you think, well, I'm just worried about me, but I believe that Jesus and his apostles give us a teaching and give us a mentality that is totally different than a lot of those. And it's really better at helping us face, uh, uh live this life the way that we need to live this life. It's a lifestyle that forms in us the more we follow Christ. We, we've been in this series for the last couple of weeks called Authentic Christianity. And I said from the very beginning, I'm not in a place to judge someone's life as a follower of Christ. I, I'm never going to judge whether or not someone is saved. That is between you and your Heavenly Father, your Creator, God. But I do believe that the Word of God teaches us that there is an aspect of that when we believe in Christ as our Savior, that we follow Christ as our Lord, Right? It doesn't stop at just believing in Christ to be our Savior. There is a call to follow Christ as our Lord. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm hoping that we are challenged from the Scripture in regards to these things. So we, one, we looked at the fact that, that Jesus Christ is important to us in our life, but we have to see Jesus as more than just important to our life. He has to be first in our life. So that's why we said we have to wake up every morning. We have to, to live every day with the mentality, but first Jesus, right? But first, Jesus. And everything that we do and everything that we come across, but first, Jesus. Last week, we looked at the aspect. We said that if we're going to follow Christ, we're going to surrender our life to Christ. We're going to follow Christ. Then what? everything that Jesus taught, he taught us that that means to serve 
That means to take on the heart of a servant. That means that we're going to serve Christ. We're going to serve the purposes of Christ. We're going to serve the body of Christ, right? If we're going to follow Christ, that means he has called us to live life where we serve one another. Today, we're going to look at another aspect of what I believe it means to follow Christ, what I believe the scripture shows us to follow Christ. And we see it in the passage that Brooke read for us this morning from the letter that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus. As we get near the end of that chapter, where it's in Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul uses this small phrase. And this small phrase in here, I believe, challenges us to, to another aspect of following Christ. And that aspect is this. We're going to surrender our life to Christ. We're going to follow Christ. That, mean, that means that we begin to understand the power of of submission, the power of submission, of what it means to submit to God and submit one to another. Now, I realize that submission is very countercultural, right? I realize that just the mention of the word submit and or submission conjures up in many of us a very combative spirit, right? I ain't submitting to nobody. All right. That's kind of where, where we, we, we kind of start to go. I'm not going to, I'm not submit because we think submitting as, are you telling me I need to make myself a doormat to other people? But that's, that's where I think we need to change our understanding of what it means as a follower of Christ to submit to one another. I don't, Jesus has not called us to be anyone's doormat. I, I go back to, uh, to his teaching when he sent his disciples out to go and to, to, to share the good news that he had been teaching to them, to those in their region. And he told them to go out and he sent them out and he told them two things that they need to carry with them. He said, you need to be innocent as doves and you need to be shrewd as serpents. Basically what he was telling them. And he says, look, you don't need to go out and take advantage of anybody and you don't need to let anybody take advantage of you. All right. So we're not meant to be anybody's doormat. But here, here's the thing we need to understand. I'm, I want to share with you some things about submission today that we need to understand. Submission does not cancel equality. Submission does not cancel equality. Jesus submitted to the Father and submitted to his will. Okay? Jesus submitted to humanity by meeting our greatest need and saving us from the punishment of sin by dying on a cross. He submitted. His submission was voluntary. He willingly submitted. But in no way was who he, who he was as equal with God threatened by his submission. Even though he submitted, his equality with God was still intact. He was still, we talked about this last week. He, he was still God as he walked this earth, right? So it, it didn't take that away. Submission does not negate equality. It does not cancel equality. The mentality of the world that we live in today is really no different at the root than the mentality of the world that Paul was writing to in that day. It was the same as humility because you have to be humble to submit one to another. And, and in that mentality, it was all, it was weakness. It was seen as a weakness because if, if I'm submitting, submitting myself to you, then I'm making myself less than you. And Jesus is like, that's the point. All right. I mean, it's, that's, that's what we're going for. But our culture, just like this culture vies for attention. It competes with one another. Right? We compete with each other. In fact, our culture says we're only thriving in life when we're hashtag winning. Right? Is that still a thing? I don't know if that's still a thing or not. But, but, when you're, but that, that's, that's how you thrive. But when we, we, when we look at the New Testament, when we look at the words of Jesus, the life of Jesus, when we look at the teachings of his apostles, those that walk with him, thriving involves humbling yourself. Thriving involves submitting one to another. Right, the, the the prevalent social customs of this day, there were three areas where most people were seen as to be someone that needs to submit. It was seen women submit, children submit, slaves submit. That's how it was submit. That's why I believe Paul goes on in his letter right after that verse to then talk about what submission looks like in regards to husband and wives, parents and children, employers, employees, because those were the three primary areas. And what Paul says is, look, submission is an all encompassing thing. We all submit to one another. And then he defines what that submission looks like one to another. Now, I'm saying there's no line of authority. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when you look across scripture, when you look across the word of God, there is in place a structure of authority that God has created, that we see it throughout nature. We see it within government. We see it within our communities. We see it within the church. We see it within the family unit. There is a structure of authority that, been his, that, that has been put in place. But just like submission does not cancel equality, submission does not negate God's order of authority. 
There is still authority there. To submit yourself to one to another is to position yourself in a place that you want to build others up for good and godly purposes. When you're submitting to each other, that's, that's one aspect of what you're trying to do. The word that Paul uses here in the Greek is the word hupotasso. It was primarily a Greek military word. All right. So we understand military. We know what submission looks like in military, but it was also, there was non-military usage, usages of that word. And when it was used in non-military context, it meant to, you have a voluntary attitude of cooperation. You assume responsibility for, for what your role is and you carry a burden to help others. Right? That it was basically you voluntarily yielding yourself in love one to another. That's what submission was pictured to be. At the center of everything Jesus did, at the center of everything Jesus taught was love. That's what drove him. That's why Paul says we should be compelled by love in Christ and for Christ. And so if, if we're going to follow Christ, then we need to have love at the center of everything that we do. But again, the context of what Paul was, was writing in is, is, is a world at the root, no different than ours, because it was a world that was not a friendly one for growing spiritually. It it was a world that he categorized as dark. It was an age that he called evil. Doesn't that sound a lot like what we live in today still too, right? It's because it's the world, but the, the way we fight against that, Paul says, And to fight against the current of the world is to do things that almost seem unnatural to us because of the world that we live in. It's to to take on characteristics that seem unnatural because the rhythm of the world is not in line with the purposes of God. The the rhythm of the world, the world has different values. The world has different agendas. The world has, has different desires. The world has different purposes and priorities. And if we let our life flow with the current of our world, then Paul is basically saying that it's going to be a waste of life. And so what we have to do is go against the gravitational flow or the gravitational pull of the world. And he tells us submission is one of the ways in which we do that. Now, when he began, when we get to this section, you know, when, when Paul wrote this letter, I don't know if you realize this or not. He didn't write it with chapters. Like when, when, if you write a letter, people don't really write letters anymore, but even you write emails and you don't put chapter one of my email. Oh no, he just, he wrote a letter. We were designated chapters later in life to help us follow and understand a little bit better. So and as he begins this section that we see chapter one, chapter five, verse one, he makes this statement. He says, imitate God, therefore, in everything that you do imitate God. See, Paul had been talking about from the very beginning of his letter to the church of Ephesus, Ephesus, what it means to be a representative of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the one that gave his life. We are saved by grace through Jesus Christ is what Paul tells them. And then he says that you are saved by grace to do good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. Right. So he's, and he goes on and he teaches them what it means to follow Christ, what it means to, to be a part of that. Then he goes into teaching them what it means to be in unity together as a body of Christ and to growing in your faith and growing in maturity. And as he goes into chapter five, he's telling us, since we are representatives of Christ, since we are trying to grow together in unity, maturing in our faith, then we cannot do the things that we once did in the life that we live before we came to relationship with Jesus Christ. So he goes into chapter five, verse one, and he says, so you've got to be imitators of God in everything that you do. Right. And then he keeps going and he says, because you are his dear children. Notice he doesn't say that you do that in order to become his dear, dear, dear children. Right. That you don't do those things in order for him to look at you and finally say, oh yeah, they're a child of God. No, because of Christ, we accept what he has done for us. We believe in him and we put ourselves in him. We become children of God. John says he gave us the right to become children of God because of that. But we do this because we are his children. We are his children. We should want to reflect his nature. We should want to reflect his character in our life. So then Paul, as he goes into this letter, he gives us three ways to live. He puts it into three categories. Verse two, he says this of chapter five. He says, live a life filled with love. Some translations say this way, walk in love. Following the example of Christ. Again, if we believe in Christ as our savior, we should follow Christ as our Lord. 
Paul is echoing this. This is what Paul is saying. This is what Paul is teaching us. Following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So we walk in love. Again, this was the center of everything that Jesus did. It was love. So we love God with everything in us. We love one another. We put that at the center of our life and we walk in love. As, as we hear these three phrases, just think about if we live this way with this mentality and if our world lived with this mentality. Walk in love. Verse 8, what does he say? He says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light or walk in light. Jesus Christ was the light that came to shine into our dark world, to reveal to us the things that are dark about our life, that are dark about our souls, that are dark about us. And he reveals that. And and when light comes on, what happens to darkness? It scatters. So when we let that light come in our life, the darkness within us is to begin to leave our life. And then, and Paul is saying that we carry that light. We shine that light. This is what Jesus called us to do. We shine that light. So again, we're walking in love. We walk in light. And then verse 15, look at what he says. He says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like, but like those who are wise. Walk in wisdom. Walk in, walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. That should be a challenge to us to do every day of our life. And, and when, we, when we wake up with the mentality, and live every day with mentality, but first Jesus, he's going to help us to have this mentality to walk in love, to walk in light, to walk in wisdom. And what kind of wisdom, where do we take our wisdom? How do we use our our wisdom? In this letter, Paul tells me, he says, you need to have wisdom in how you use your time. You need to have wisdom in how you relate one to another. You need to have wisdom in how you execute the calling that God has placed on your life, the giftings that God has given you and what he's called you to do and where he's called you to. And you walk in wisdom. There's a verse from the, the, the one the Bible considers one of the wisest men to ever live. It, Proverbs chapter three, I've, this verse, I've been carrying this verse with me for the last several weeks. I don't know, maybe it's just for me. And maybe I need to hear it and remember it, but I want to share it with you. Proverbs chapter, I've shared it with my staff and some others. Proverbs chapter three, verse 21, my child, don't lose sight of common sense and discernment. Hang on to them. That's pretty simple, right? Common sense and discernment, both of which come from God. God created, whether you realize it or not, God created you with common sense. All right. Some of us struggle to find it, but God created you with common sense. And he gives you the ability through his Holy Spirit to have discernment. And, and, and that is walking in wisdom with God. Walk in love. Walk in light. Walk in wisdom. What would our world look like if we did that with one another? See, Paul is, Paul is wanting them to understand. We, we live in a world that, we, that teaches us you should subject yourself onto others. You should subject yourself on others. You, you should substitute pleasure for fulfillment. You should substitute things for people. You should substitute power for purpose. The world wants you to, to succumb to its way of thinking. But Paul says that, no, you combat that mentality. You combat that nature with submitting one to another. And so we go back to our verses that we read, that Brooke read for us this morning, verses 18 to 21. He says that we do this out of reverence for Christ. Some translations say it this way, out of fear of Christ. See, what Paul is saying is in a culture that it makes no sense to do this. Your rationale, your thinking, the reason you submit one to another is because of your reverence for Christ, because of your fear of Christ. And I want to hit the double, because they, we look at whether we're like, well, that's two different words in our understanding, reverence and fear. It is. But I believe there is a both and understanding of this. There is a reverence that we need to have for Christ. We, we can't approach Christ as he's our homeboy. That, like we used to say back in the 80s, all right? I don't know what the, 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 the word is now, but anyway, we have a reverence for Christ. There is a reverence, a respect, a high respect, but there's also, there is also a fear. There is an understanding of the power of God in our life. When we walk outside of the will of a creator, a king of God, listen, we don't serve God because we're afraid of God. That's not why we serve God. We we serve God because we know he loves us because Jesus Christ gave his life for us and went through one of the most torturous deaths that 
anyone could ever face and go through willingly so that we could have access to the creator, to our father, to God. So we don't serve God because we're afraid of God, but there's also a humble understanding of the power of God and the consequences that come when you're outside of God. Listen, I, I'm gonna, I, I had a father that loved me and, and, and I'm, I speak from my understanding, my relationship with my father. I know that every home is different and I know that some people grew up in a place that there was the, the only reason your dad was your dad because there was literal fear. I get that. And that shouldn't be the case. But I had a father that loved me and I I didn't obey my father because I was afraid of my father. I obeyed my father most all the time because, because I knew he loved me and because he created boundaries out of love for me in my life. Here's what I did fear. I feared the consequences that would come when I did not stay within those boundaries and follow his instructions, right? I feared, I feared the authority that he had every right to yield as my father when I didn't stay within those boundaries. That's what I feared. But I loved my father and my father, I knew my father loved me. We serve God and we follow God, not because we're afraid of him, but we also have an understanding of the power he possesses. Jesus Christ taught this to his disciples. He said, He said, look, he said, don't fear man who can take your life. You need to fear God who can destroy your soul. That was the words of Jesus. All right. You know, the fear you would have in your body. Were you facing someone that was threatening to take your life? Jesus says, don't fear that. You need to fear the God that can destroy your soul. We we just came out of the book of Genesis. And twice in that series, we looked at the topic of judgment. When we looked at Noah and we looked at Sodom and Gomorrah and we said, the judgment of God is inevitable. That's the power that God wills or he has the right to. But we said the grace of God is available, right? But we understand that God has a power and a right to judge. When Paul was writing to the church of Rome and he was writing to to those that were following Christ at that time, and he was saying, look, the children of Israel, they were God's chosen people. They're still God's chosen people, but, but they chose to not receive Jesus Christ for who he was. And that opened the door for you as Gentiles to receive Jesus Christ. But look at what he tells them. Romans chapter 11, verse 20. Remember those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. But look at what he says. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. If you choose to neglect who God is and what he's made available for you. So we submit to one another, Paul says, and we take into account that the Lordship of Jesus Christ is not something to be scoffed at. But here's the thing, and this is what Paul is saying. The more we are overwhelmed by the awesomeness of who God is, by the awesomeness of who Jesus Christ is, the more we're willing to submit to him, the more we're willing to submit one to another. Another way to say that is the more we submit to Christ, the more our heart is primed to submit one to another. And so he tells him, he says, look, You need to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with one another, making music to the Lord. And you need to do this with gratefulness in your heart. And I believe he's saying it this way. I'll put it in the words that we we use and the things that we say we value. Here's the part of the body of Christ here at Bethel. The more we worship God with wonder, the more we serve with selflessness. The more we serve with willingness to submit one to another. And Paul lets us know, he says, that God's given you the Holy Spirit to help you in all this. He says, so don't be drunk with wine, but be drunk in the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. We know what, I mean, alcohol doesn't always serve great purposes in relationships. I mean, Brad Paisley told us what alcohol can do, right? I mean... Some of you know that. Some of you are going to be Googling later. Al- Brad pays the alcohol. What? But that's why we have the Spirit. That's why we have the Spirit, Paul says. 
Because the Spirit enables us to submit to the Father and to walk with the Father, to do exactly what we talked about in week one, to put Christ first. That's why He gave us the Spirit. That's one aspect. He said, and and, and he, he gives us the Spirit to empower us, as, as we saw from Peter last week. We each, each one of us have a, an, a, a gift from the Spirit. And why do we use that Spirit? To serve one another. Paul goes in to talk about in detail what some of those gifts look like in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You've been given that gift. The Spirit empowers you and enables you with gifts to serve one another. But Paul is saying too, the Spirit enables you to submit one to another. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Paul tells us what that is in in his letter to the church of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, if we think about our world, we think, man, if we all live with those characters and those qualities, how much better could things possibly be? And Paul says, against those things, there's no law. In other words, we, we consume our mentality. The church of Galatia was consuming their mentality about the law. Paul was saying, if you just consume yourself on the Holy Spirit and let him produce these qualities in you, you don't have to worry about whether or not you're following the law. The, the, the law of Moses or the law of the land. These are qualities that the Spirit enables you to do. Imagine if we demonstrated those those qualities. This is how we were originally intended to be one with another. Because the family works better when we demonstrate these qualities in the family. Our communities work better when these qualities are demonstrated. Church is better when these qualities are demonstrated one with another. See, submitting ourselves one to another... It's the opposite of self-assertion. It's the opposite of an independent, domineering spirit. Submitting is, is not that. Submitting is a desire for us to the extent that we can, as Paul said in his letter to the Church of Rome, to the extent that we can, to get along with one another. To see the betterment of one another. And we like it when people submit to us, not in this form of authority, but when people just submit and they, they help our need. They see our need. They hear our need. They understand us. But that can't be the mentality we go through life searching for people to do that for us. We have to go through life looking for how we can do that for others. That's why all throughout the New Testament, we see the phrase one another used in regards to the early church. Because the early church leaders knew, Jesus knew, you cannot fulfill you. I can't fulfill me. You need more than what you have to offer yourself. I need more than what I have to offer myself. We need one another. I mean, that phrase is used about a hundred times in the New Testament. Fifty-nine of those are direct commands to the church of what they should do. Submission, I believe, means being willing to be transparent with one another. It means being willing to be accountable to one another. Being willing to belong to one another. Being willing to be cared for and to care for one another. When you look at the early church in Acts, as they're navigating this aspect of learning what it means to follow Christ, of serving one another, submitting one to another, submitting to God, serving God. As they're navigating that whole aspect, all the while they're seeing the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, multiply. They're seeing it grow. And why does that happen? Because our submission one to another in love and honor and service it is a way of making visible what God has done in our life. And when, when we, to take the phrase that Paul used in his church to the Philippians, when we deny ourselves, we don't just, we don't, when we deny ourselves, we, we don't just build up the self-esteem of one another. We build up the Christ esteem of his church in our world. And you look at Acts chapter 2 and you see what they did. You see a synopsis of what they did. What do they do? 
they read the Bible together. They fellowshiped together. They ate together. They prayed for each other. They served each other and helped each other. They worshiped together. They constantly invited other people to join them. They brought people with them. And and they did this in gatherings, in large gatherings at the temple. They did it in small gatherings in their home. And this is what we see all throughout the church. Now, I know, you know, last week I talked about serving uh, and and I brought it to an aspect of how we, as part of the body of Christ, it's, it's what we do. See, we, we're just, I said last, we are just one small aspect of the body of Christ, of the church. And so as a small, we want to do everything we can to empower the body and equip the body to grow together in unity, one with another. To equip and empower the body to serve the body. And so I talked about last week how we as just a part of our body can serve each other, can serve our community. Well, I, I want to share how I believe just one aspect we can submit to one another just within the body together as a part of our body. This, and I am not, again, I go back, I'm not a judge of someone. I'm not saying you are not a follower of Christ if you don't serve in some way at Bethel Worship Center or you don't submit in some way that I'm about to tell you now. That's not what I'm saying. Don't, don't misconstrue. I'm saying that as, as we empower and enable and equip the body here at the church, these are ways that we want to make available for you to be able to do these things. And so... I believe that one way that we can submit one to another is when we get together with people to not just listen to the word of God, but to talk about how we can apply the word of God and how we can encourage our hearts to grow with one another. And, and this is something that I don't want, just want to talk about. This is something that we want to invest in. This is something that we want to pour resources into. We have done this throughout the years. We have, we have, I've got, we've got cabinets next door with resources, with curriculums, with things that we have used for people to use as small groups, as discipleship groups, as different types of things. We've had it for, for children, for youth, and we constantly do this. We, we provide these resources. Our children do it so that they can get together here in a large atmosphere, but then divide up into small groups and talk about it. So our, our youth do the same thing. They get together, they hear the word, but then they get together in smaller t- groups to talk about how they can apply this in, in their life. We want to continue to be able to do that. And we want to invest in, in that. And so we're taking another step to make an invest in, in that, to invest in you, to invest in the discipleship of, the, of this. And the way that we're, we're able to invest is because you invest in the ministries that take place in this house through your giving. But we want to help you grow in your faith as a disciple of Christ. We want to help you grow, hear me, with one another. To grow in hunger with one another over the Word of God. Because I believe applying the Word of God happens better when we submit ourselves to each other and we open our hearts to one another and we're transparent with one another. We're accountable to one another. We belong to one another. We grow with one another. Watch this quick video. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the work of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians and I believe you will too. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum. And you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're going to look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right now, media. It's for groups. It's for personal devotion. It's for parents. The bullseye of parenting is to raise children to become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep pressing them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. And now, it's yours. We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. So check your inbox for the digital invitation and download the app for instant access to thousands of biblically-based videos. Get equipped. Get inspired. 
this is our early Christmas present to you. Um, you can think of this resource as a Netflix for discipleship, all right? Um, there are over 20,000 resources within this library um, that you can have access to, and they're continually adding new things. Um, you're going like, to, as the video said, you're going to get an email this afternoon. It's going to go out after the second service, and there's going to be simple instructions in that to talk to you about how what you can do to go on, to accept the invite, and then to, to be a part of right now under our church. When you go into it, if you look at the top of the page, you'll see what I'm talking about. When you get to the screen at the top, you'll see Bethel Worship Center. If you click Bethel Worship Center's name, you'll already see some resources uh, put together that if you wanted to study those, all of those relate to things that we have talked about in this past year here at Bethel Worship Center. Now, if you don't get an email, it's because we don't have your email address. Um, I would say start by checking your spam folder. But don't freak out if you don't get an email either because we're making it available in other ways. Uh, That thing right there, that's called a QR code if you don't know what that is. Some of you are doing it now because I see phones going up. All you do is you open your camera, put it on that thing, and it opens up this link, and you click that, and bam, there you are, right? And you're not accepting the mark of the beast when you do that, so just rest assured, okay? This is not an end times thing, but all right, this is technology, okay? And um, But we're also, we've got flyers that you're going to get as you leave today. Those flyers are going to have that same code. We're going to put it on our website. And I can hear some of you now, I am not a tech person. I don't know how to use technology. I understand. We're not doing this to scare you. Listen, uh, uh, my mom sitting over here, I love her. I don't think she's afraid for me to tell you. She's like 83, 84, something in that range, 29, somewhere in that, somewhere in that range. But this woman right here, she knows she, she embraces what she can. If technology, she uses her iPad daily. She's got that thing working puzzles, uh, taking care of her doctor's visits that are coming up. She's got, she's doing that. She knows how to use her television. And when she don't know, you know what she does? She calls me or my, my nephew. She's calling us. Come help me figure this thing out. And so that's what we're saying to you. If you are not sure how to do this, you're afraid of how to get started with it, call us. Come see us. We want to help you get, get started in this. In fact, in three weeks, November 26, 6 p.m., here in the auditorium, I'm going to be doing a briefing of how all this works. So you've got three weeks to get signed up, to, to explore it on your own, and then come and see if, if you're interested to see what it all looks like, how you can use it online on your website, how you can use it through your TV. If you have a Fire Stick, a Roku, an Apple TV, or whatever other streaming services that you can stream television, uh, you can do that. You can do it on your tablet. You can do it on your phone. There's so many ways that you can do this. But this is a resource, again, that you can grow personally. You can use it as a family. But you can also use it, and I would encourage you to use it, in groups one with another. Because when we get together as groups, we're able to submit one to another, be transparent with one another, be accountable to one another, belong to one another, and build one another up. Because I believe applying the word happens better when we submit to each other this way. And if you say, well, David, I don't want to do it with technology. we got a group that's been meeting in this house that's right back here every Sunday for the last several weeks. And I've talked about this group. They're just going in there, and they're just having conversation around the word of God that was shared on Sunday mornings. You can come tonight and join, I think, join them in that house tonight. They're, they're prepared if the group grew to expand. My heart is to see this church filled with groups of people growing in God's word together. Through the years, it's been called and done different ways, right? And and here's what I know. I know a lot of you want this. I hear a lot of you talking about wanting Sunday school, wanting life groups, whatever you want to call it, life groups, discipleship groups, community groups, small groups, whatever you want to call it. We want to give you that access, and we want to give you the ability to be able to do that, and we want to work with you to schedule when you can do that. Jenny and I did a group with people at the beginning of this year. And that the purpose of that group was to see what group life looks like and then to send them out to do it. And some of them have grown out to do that. One, for instance, I know of is a couple that opened up their home this fall. And when they did that, they had people say, I want to be a part of that. And those people came. They built relationships with one another. They studied God's word together. They fellowship together. They grew together. 
And I think life happened together through that. We want to encourage that opportunity to go on. But listen, as much as you want that to be able to happen, we need people willing to facilitate that to happen, right? We need people willing to say, I'll take it. And notice I didn't say lead because people are scared of the word lead. But all you've got to do is just say, I'll be one that we can get together and I can facilitate a conversation. Or I can at least open my home or I can do whatever. We want to help you do that. So I would love as we go into the new year to at least, this is a small number, to at least just see 10 people say, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to be one that will facilitate. I'm willing to be one that will uh, will, will open up and, and invite others. And we will help you figure out the destination, if it's your home, if it's on this campus. But I'd love at least 10. So what I'm asking you to do today, I, I realize last week and this week we're ending differently than usual. But again, I want to, as a body, my goal is, as a pastor of this church, our goal as pastoral staff of this church is to give you ways to put into practice the Word of God as a body where, where God has planted us. So if you're willing to be one of those people, it, I, I just encourage you today to text the word groups to the number. Throw that number on the, on the screen, Ryan. I know it says new. That's if you're new. But just change the word new to groups and text it to that number, 803-676-7566. And we will walk with you on how to take the next step. Does that make sense? All right? And if you don't want to text, then come talk to. Okay? All right. Then we can do it that way. Stand with me this morning. I really do hope that you take this gift from us to you. And, and, and I'll say this too as, as we wrap up. I, Jenny and I have been a part of group over the last several years. We love the relationships that we have in our group. We're a part of a group now. I'm, I'm not the point person of that group. I don't facilitate the group. Me and Jenny don't do that. We have submitted ourselves to others. Right? I'm not saying that to be, hey, look at me. I'm so, no, I'm just saying it's what we do. And so we, we have thoroughly loved being a part of this group that we're a part of. Growing in relationship with them diving into the word of God together and what it says about how we should live our life and having fun together and eating together. I love that. Right? This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to submit one to another, to serve one another. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have shown us in your word through those that walk this their life close to you and learn from you what it means to follow Christ. God, we know it means to put you first in everything of our life. We know it means that Jesus, you have called us to a life of service that you yourself did not come to be served, but to serve. So we want to people be a people that serve one another. And father, you've called us to submit to you, to your will, to your way, You've called us to submit one to another. So, Father, help us to be able to put those things into practice. We've got one more aspect that we're going to look at next week, God, that you know that you've called us to through your word, and it is a tough one. But, Father, you have gifted us with your Holy Spirit to live this life together, to live this life for you, to live this life serving one another, submitting to one another, submitting to you and serving you. And so, Father, I pray that you help us to see how we can do that. Father, take the opportunities that we as a church are making available. Use those, God. Bless them by your Holy Spirit. Whether it's an area of service, whether it's an area of discipleship, God, use those areas. And Father, whatever other place that you have in the heart of someone in this house today or watching online to follow you by serving or submitting. God, let them see what you are calling them to and let them follow you. Because Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the salvation we have in him. The life change that we can embrace through what Jesus Christ did for us. The eternal life that we have because of Jesus Christ, because of his death, because of his resurrection. And Father, because we believe in Christ as our Savior, we want to follow Christ as our Lord. So help us every day 
to follow you. And we thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccamden.com, go to our contact page. You'll find the link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803-676-7566. And we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.